Welcome back to Coin A Corner. Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 from the Sermon on the Mount. Specifically, what we're looking at are the dynamics of tense, voice, and mood with the verbs and how they communicate and affect the meaning of the passage. So let's jump right in and look at verse 1 in Koine. Me crinete, hina me crithete. So me crinete uh, is judge not, do not judge, and hina me crithete is hina in order that or so that me crithete you might not be or you should not be judged. So do not judge in order that you should not be judged. Let's break down the verbs. So crinete is a present active imperative, second person plural. So an imperative is a command. You're being compelled to do something. You're being given an order. And imperatives come in... Uh, in presence or aorists, and the presence represent a linear action. You're, you're being ordered to do something continually, and the aorists uh, are a punctiliar action. You're being ordered to either start something or stop something, uh, but not something that's an ongoing, continual action. So this is, as, uh, as I mentioned already, this is a present imperative. So he's saying, Jesus is saying, do not continually be judging. Um, so if it were an aorist, he would either be saying, don't start judging or stop judging because it's punctiliar or don't judge in this particular instance. Uh, but, but that's not what it is. It's linear. It's present. Do not continually be judging. Uh, why not? And then he tells us, Hina, in order that, or so that, <coughs> me crithete, uh, so that you might not be judged at some point in the future. And it's in uh, this, this second verb is a subjunctive, and it deals with the realm of probability or possibility. It's not talking about something that's already happened. It's not talking about something that will definitely happen. It's talking about a possibility that is yet to be realized. And because it's aorist, uh, it's an aorist passive subjunctive, he's talking about something that might begin to happen to you at some future time. So let's put the pieces together. If you don't live a life, he says, judge not, do not judge. If you don't live a life of continual judging, you may have avoid, in order that you might not be judged, uh, you may avoid the beginning of a judgment that happens sometime in the future. So he's almost certainly not talking about a reciprocal not judging between people. Um, why do I say that? Because if he were they would probably both be in the present rather than the first being present and the other being uh, in the aorist. He would be saying, don't continually judge in order that you not be continually judged. Like, treat each other nicely. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't live a life of continual judgment in order that you might avoid this judgment that might happen to you in the future. Um, <clears throat> Let's move on to verse 2. The first, we're going to look at verse 2 in two parts, A and B. We'll look at the first part first, which makes good sense. En hogar krimati krinete kritheseste. Okay. And so whenever you see that gar, it's a, it's a post positive. It comes after the first or second word in a sentence. So gar just means for. And enho is in in that, or uh, with what, judgment, krimati. So krino is the verb I judge. Um, krisis is the noun for the process of judgment. Krima is the noun for the verdict of judgment. So here he says, in hogar krimati, in what verdict you judge, with what verdict you judge, krinete is you judge, um, <clears throat> you shall be judged, is the last verb, krithesis they. So, krimati is the verdict, 
Crinite is the, the present active indicative verb of you judging. So with whatever judgment you continually judge, he then says, you shall be judged, future passive indicative. So with whatever judgment, with whatever verdict, you continually judge people, that's the verdict you will be judged with in the future at some point in the future. So the same verdict you continually apply will be applied to you at some point in the future. Let's look at part B. Kai en ho metro, metrete, uh, metrefesetai, humin. So kai is and, in which again, like we had in part A, metro, the, the measure, the part, um, metrete, you measure, the verb of the, using the same stem. So with this measure that you measure out, um, to you it shall be measured. Um, so we see again the use of the continual with the measuring on your part, but then the risk is down the road there'll be a future measuring and the same standard, the same part, the same measure that you used uh, will be applied to you. Um, so there's a great parallel in parts A and B. The same measure that's used, just like he says, the same judgment that you use will be applied to you, the same measure that you, you use will be applied to you. This is great wordplay in the second part of verse 2. So krino, as we've already said, is the Greek verb for I judge. <clears throat> it shares a Latin root, kreno, C-R-E-N-O, and both mean to separate, to part, or to sift. And it's uh, commonly used mark, uh, marketplace language. So let's say you go and buy uh, two cups of wheat. The seller is going to measure out, he's going to judge out, he's going to sift out or part out the two cups that you have purchased. And when he says in part B here, when he says the measure that you use, is the one that's going to be used for you. If you have a cheating measure, right, so if your cup isn't really a full cup, um, you don't want to be that kind of measurer because at some point it's going to be measured back to you using a short-changed measure. Do you want to get what you deserve? Then you better not use a faulty measure. Um, so part A of verse 2 uh, with the same judgment that you use, you will be judged, is like the trial. And part B, with whatever measure you measure out, it'll be measured to you, is like the punishment, the trial and the punishment phase. Pretty awesome wordplay. Um, think of it this way. Have you ever had the two kids, one piece of cake problem? Right, so you have two kids, there's one piece of cake left, both kids want cake, and so how do you solve this problem? you appeal to their rational self-interest. You have one kid slice the cake, and then the other kid gets to choose which piece of cake he or she wants. Now, if they're operating with rational self-interest, the cake-cutting kid doesn't want to get stuck with the, quote, bad piece of cake. So he or she is going to cut the cake as evenly as possible, so that it doesn't matter which piece is left after the choosing. So why does this matter? Because we live in a world that is plagued with a thing called just world theory. Um, in our minds, we tend to think that people either do get what they deserve or they should get what they deserve, right? And that um, presents us with two problems. Uh, the first problem being and I'll speak for myself because I'm sure you're much more perfect than I am. Um, I lack a perfect understanding of the circumstances and the situation that other people are in. I don't know all the facts. I can't see everything that's going on. And as a result, uh, I will probably draw some conclusions about what people do and don't deserve that aren't accurate. Um, which brings us to fault number two, what Jesus says in verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 7 is you're opening yourself up when you decide what people do and don't deserve. You're opening yourself up to those same standards being applied to you. It's like that great Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, um, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. So when you start saying everyone should get exactly what they deserve, 
you may be painting yourself into a corner from which you cannot extricate yourself. Um, those are the two major problems. And so then there's a third part that I think is really interesting in the verbs <clears throat> in verses one and two, as well as the single personal pronoun that's used. Um, Jesus exclusively speaks to you plural. You shouldn't judge continually in order that you plural um, might not be judged in the future. For with whatever judgment you continually judge, you plural will be judged in the future. And with whatever measure you continually measure out, to you plural it will be measured. Um, he makes no explicit reference to the other guy. He only cares about what you do in this situation. And I lump me in with you because we're all a part of the you plural in the statement, right? So uh, Jesus reinforces that concept that you need to be worrying about you and not the other guy in this judge not lest you be judged dynamic with the rest of the pericope, with the rest of the little chunk of the Sermon on the Mount. Because the very next thing he says is, don't worry about the speck in your neighbor's eye. First, worry about that huge plank hanging out of your eye. So he, again, he brings us back to the notion that the only real control you have in this situation is how you will operate in regard to others, how you will relate, how you will judge, or more explicitly with a command, how you will not judge, right? Pretty, pretty great stuff. So just like a kid with a rational self-interest in cake, uh, it would do me well, it would do all of us well, to treat the other kids in the manner in which we wish to be treated. Um, because if we find ourselves in that uh, foolish consistency of Emerson, um, we, we're going to paint ourselves into a pretty ugly corner potentially here. So imperatives and subjunctives and uh, present active indicatives and future passive indicatives, the role of tense, voice, mood, uh, person and number, the interaction of those things is what paints this very vivid picture warning us off so that we never find ourselves unfortunately stuck with a bad piece of cake. Hope this was good for you. It was great for me. And uh, if you liked it, please share it with someone who's not already a Coin a Corner follower. Like it. Uh, do whatever YouTube-y kind of things you would do with it. And thanks again. Until next time, Kars Kai Arena Humane. Grace and peace to you.